Welcome back to another week of Space News Summarization. SpaceX make huge progress with Starship, despite aborting two crucial tests, Blue Origin's Falcon 9 killer finally goes vertical, sort of, and Falcon 9 launches three times in under 24 hours. Insane. All of this and more, let's jump into Starship news. <laughs> Now, to begin, in last Monday's episode of Space This Week, I covered the fact that Ship 28 had been fully stacked on top of Booster 10 and then de-stacked after a very short amount of time, right before the video was uploaded. Well, this week is the same, actually. To elaborate, following the D-Stack at the beginning of the week, Lab Padre captured crews working on the hot stage ring, so the reason for the hasty D-Stack was almost certainly because things weren't lining up properly between the two vehicles. However, work here was swift, and it wasn't too long before SpaceX had another go raising Ship 28. Slightly. This mild lift was to allow crew access to the aft portion of the vehicle to ensure that its interface with the booster was all okay. NASA Space Flight's Boca Chica Gal captured workers performing lots of checkouts at the ship's interface that connects it to the Super Heavy's hot staging ring before the lift then continued, with the chopsticks raising Ship 28 all the way to the top of the tower once again in the midst of a beautiful Tuesday morning sunrise, and completing the second Flight 3 full stack. The whole reason SpaceX was fully stacking the rocket was in support of the first wet dress rehearsal for Flight 3. A wet dress rehearsal, or WDR, is what it sounds like, a simulation of a real launch where everything is activated as if the rockets were going to launch, except without the engine ignition and all that stuff that makes a rocket leave the ground. To do this though, some preparations were required. First order was connecting Ship 28 to its quick disconnect arm. Crews were spotted by Lab Padre Chief removing all the ship's QD panel protective port covers, and after getting clear and swinging the crew access platform out of the way, the quick disconnect arm then moved forwards and connected to the ship, then detached in what we can assume was a retraction test, followed by a second extension and connection to the ship. We also saw an actuation test of the forward and aft flaps of the ship shortly after the quick disconnect arm was attached. During launch, the ship quick disconnect arm is the connection that supplies the Starship with propellant and power. Later in the week, NASA Spaceflight's Sean Doherty captured workers performing checkouts of the umbilical pipeworks on the quick disconnect arm. By comparison, here's the booster's quick disconnect up close, captured by Sean Doherty. Boca Chica Gal captured crews working on this assembly as well. Anyway, full stack testing commenced on Wednesday. The chopsticks opened up their grip around the ship and lowered down to launch position. But as the tank farm began ramping into action, things dampened down rather quickly and then stopped altogether. A pressure relief valve was spotted being replaced at the tank farm, after which another test attempt was made. Some frosting on the exposed side of Ship 28 indicated propellant load had begun, but this was then, again, cut short. It's not clear why. During this test, the adjacent highway had been closed, so I guess SpaceX wanted to make the most of this even if they couldn't do the full wet dress rehearsal, and so we then saw testing of the water deluge system. Following this, we also saw a total of seven carbon dioxide purge tests from Booster 10. Crews are making quick work of the fabrication of the latest Starship Launch Tower 2 segment. Over the course of just two weeks, we've seen it go from just a pile of individual beams to looking like a very recognisable structure, with all four vertical beams, well, vertical, and significant progress made on the interconnecting horizontal beams. The construction of Mega Bay 2 has been a hallmark of Space This Week's Starship segment pretty much since it began construction, but it really looks like this thing is almost done, exteriorly at least. The final bit of external cladding to the top of the building was installed on Tuesday, bringing us a major step forward towards completion. Of course, the interior is still a ways off completion. It's not exactly clear what SpaceX has planned for this, especially given that we recently learned that SpaceX is planning to build a five-story office building adjacent to the under construction star factory, in addition to a six-story parking lot. So I wonder what the plans are for the double height interior at the top of Mega Bay 2. The rapid expansion could just be par for the course for SpaceX at Boca Chica. I mean, comparing what things look like now compared to how they did in 2019 just five years ago says a lot about how fast they build things up. Or alternatively, the building of new offices could be associated with the fact that Elon Musk announced that SpaceX has moved its state of incorporation from Delaware to Texas, and that he plans to move Tesla to Texas as well. 
Now, the reason for this move is almost certainly because of the fact that a Delaware judge ruled in favor of Tesla investors, who themselves filed a lawsuit due to the fact that they felt that Elon's $56 billion pay package was excessive. I mean, objectively, it probably is. It's by far the largest ever compensation deal for an executive, but hey, I don't want to start diverging into the more polarizing aspect of SpaceX. I'm just trying to explain what these concrete pump trucks that Lab Padre spotted by the Star Factory are probably doing. Whew, good save, I think. <laughs> Anyway, the week wrapped up with a few different things. We saw a test of the fire suppression system, or FireX as it's been colloquially named, followed by a second wet dress rehearsal test. Again, unfortunately, the test was aborted, with only partial fueling of the booster and ship, as evidenced by only the small amount of frosting on both vehicles. We're not sure why the test was aborted at this stage, but of course we wait with bated breath to see what SpaceX do next. Or rather, we don't. Remember how I opened the Starship segment of this video by saying that last Monday's episode began with the very recent D-stack of Ship 28 from Booster 10? Well, now it's the same. <laughs> the ship has once again been D-stacked from Booster 10. And earlier today, Starship Gazer captured this shot of it being transported to the suborbital test stand, presumably so that it could conduct further static fire testing of one or more of its Raptor 2 engines. Remember that Ship 28 has had some of its Raptors replaced since its last static fire, so SpaceX might want to put the engines through their paces again. Though, sometimes it can be hard to predict the reasoning behind all that goes on at Starbase. <laughs> What's definitely more predictable than Starship with SpaceX is Falcon 9 launches, since, you know, they've already happened. Like their 300th ever Falcon 9 launch, which was last Thursday. This was a fairly run-of-the-mill Starlink mission. The rocket carried 22 Starlink V2s to Starlink Shell 6 in low Earth orbit. While this may have been one giant leap for Falcon 9, representing its 300th ever launch, this was only one small step for this first stage booster, B1082 as this was only its second ever landing, which it completed successfully on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You in the Pacific Ocean. What's crazy for SpaceX is that this wasn't just the only Falcon 9 launch of the week, this wasn't just the only Falcon 9 launch of three within 24 hours. The 24 hours of madness began with the launch of a military payload from Cape Canaveral Space Launch Complex 40. The rocket carried two hypersonic and ballistic tracking space sensor satellites for the United States Space Force, as well as four missile tracking satellites. Following stage separation, the rocket's first stage, Booster 1078, landed at Landing Zone 2 at Cape Canaveral, completing its seventh overall mission. Staying within the 24 hours of Falcon 9 launch frenzy, the next launch was the first Nova C mission, which will land commercial payloads and five NASA-supported instruments near the Lunar South Pole as part of NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services program. If it interests you, I've done a whole dedicated video on the Nova C program, recreating this launch in Kerbal Space Program at the same time. The lunar lander launched on this mission was the publicly traded company Intuitive Machines' Odysseus lander. The flight plan for this lander is to make touchdown at the Malapert A crater, about 300 kilometers from the lunar south pole, and if successful, this will mark the first successful landing of an American spacecraft on the moon since Apollo 17, over 50 years ago. Just before it lands, the lander will eject the tiny Eagle Cam CubeSat, which will drop to the lunar surface to capture third-person views of the Odysseus's landing. The third of the three launches was the aforementioned Starlink mission, so no need to go over that again, but it's worth acknowledging just how good Falcon 9's launch cadence is. In 2013, Falcon 9 launched three times in one year. Now, less than 11 years later, it's launching three times in one day. Honestly, it's mind-blowing, and we can probably attribute a good proportion of that to the fact that it has a reusable first stage. But soon, hopefully, Rocket Lab will achieve a similar cadence once they get Electron's first stage reusable. So far, they're not quite there yet, but they did complete a successful launch last Sunday. This was mission on closer inspection, and the rocket launched from Launch Complex 1 on the Mahia Peninsula. On board was the Japanese-built ADRAS-J, which stands for the Active Debris Removal by Astroscale Japan, which, as the name suggests, is a space removal demonstration satellite. It'll rendezvous with a spent Japanese H-2A rocket upper stage in low Earth orbit in order to demonstrate operations in close proximity to spent rocket stages to help further the development of spacecraft to eventually deorbit space debris. Speaking of Japanese spaceflight, Japan made their first successful flight of their H-3 launch vehicle last week. This took place on the 17th of February, and the rocket blasted off the pad from the Tanegashima launch complex, carrying three satellites to low Earth orbit. 
One satellite was built by Canon Electronics and was designed for Earth observation. Go figure. <laughs> a smaller Earth observation CubeSat was also deployed, built by Japanese firm Siren Co. The third payload was operated by Jackson themselves. This was the VEP-4 satellite designed solely to evaluate the launch vehicle itself. It was separated after the deorbit burn of the rocket's second stage and consists of a dummy mass and a couple of small CubeSats designed to evaluate the performance of the h 3s separation system. Moving on, Blue Origin's new Glenn is vertical on the pad, guys, this is not a drill. Well, actually, I guess it technically kind of is. You see, this is only Blue Origin's Pathfinder New Glen first stage. But with flight hardware already being put together in the hangar, by no means a Blue Origin too far off launch at this stage. The only unfortunate thing with this picture, taken by NASA Spaceflight's Max Evans, is that the adjacent towers make this seem very small. Make no mistake, New Glenn is a heavy lift launch vehicle, and at full stack, it'll be around the same height as SLS Block 1. This rocket is serious business. I'm so stoked to see progress storming ahead. I had a busy week in Kerbal Space Program last week. I launched a MUN rocket to the mysterious golden alien Stargate hidden on a MUN Mary, and I go through the basics of how to get there. I also want to give a big shout out to my Patreon supporters and YouTube channel members who helped make all of this content possible. I wouldn't be able to afford the footage licensing costs without you, so believe you me, your support is truly appreciated. Anyway, if you think the aforementioned KSP mission sounded good, then there should now be a clickable card on screen, and that's it! This Saturday is the one year anniversary for KSP2's release, by the way, so you can be sure I have a video lined up for that. Hit subscribe so you don't miss it, and that's it! Thank you for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.